true and conversely false are not properties of reality. By this I mean there is no underlying state of reality that could hold a Boolean property. We as humans can choose to ascribe true and false to certain systems, but at the bottom of those systems is someone saying it just is. Computers don't use binary numbers. And here I am doing binary numbers with computers. But the computer's not doing any binary numbers. It's just switches. Switches that are open, switches that are closed. The binary numbers are in my head and in your head because we agreed open switch will represent that with a zero. Closed switch will represent that with a one. And we invent the binary number system to help us do that. Charge symmetry means interactions are unaffected if all the charges are swapped. In other words, there is nothing special about what we call positive charge. Nature treats it exactly equal and opposite to negative charge. I came to this conclusion while posing the question, if you infinitely ask why. There is this favorite clip of mine where Richard Feynman is asked about why two magnets repel, and he responds, By people. And when you explain a, a why, you have to be in some framework that you allow something to be true. Otherwise, you're perpetually asking why. But if you're like me, the conclusion that something just is, or things must be explained in terms of other things which just are, feels so unsatisfying. So I kept asking myself, why is it just is true? What gives this statement truth? And what is truth? It turns out the answer I was looking for has much further reaching implications than I initially noticed. The Moynch-Hausen trilemma is a thought experiment that states that any attempt to prove that some proposition is true must end with either a circular, axiomatic, or regressive argument. In the circular argument, the theory and proof support each other. It is what it is. In the regressive argument, each proof requires a further proof, ad infinitum. So this proof requires the one before it, and so on. In the axiomatic argument, the proof rests on accepted precepts. Historically, these axioms were assumed to be obviously true. But as we learned from Euclid, the father of geometry, this can be limiting. In his beautiful books, which were at the center of mathematical teaching for over two millennia, he asserted a postulate where the three angles of a triangle in a Euclidean plane always add up to 180 degrees. This isn't the case on non-uniform surfaces like spheres, where you can construct a triangle with three 90-degree angles. You can arbitrarily call anything an axiom to help solve a problem, even things that seemingly have no basis in reality. I argue that those accepted precepts fall under the circular argument, given that axioms are asserted. To reiterate, all attempts to prove that something is true must end with one of these three arguments. That's a big deal. Seemingly, nothing is true. Nothing can be true. This seems opposite to intuition. Things must be true, right? We could try to ground ourselves by using a simple example, like 1 plus 1 equal 2. But what I'm pointing out is that someone asserted some aspect of that statement such that it is true. If we change the assertion, the output could change. Many assertions are implied in typical day-to-day, -day, as you have to start from somewhere when teaching, and in fact, mathematics itself is axiomatic. One day, humans began to build the rules of math, and we built something quite far-reaching and repeatable. But then we realized those rules were built upon nothing, so we went back and tried to strengthen the foundation. Mathematical objects and their properties, the things we prove theorems about, are defined in terms of other mathematical objects and their properties. Math is built out of simpler math, hence the pyramid idea. But where does this process of simplification end? In other words, what holds up the bottom of the pyramid? In the late 1800s and early 1900s, this was a real crisis for mathematicians and philosophers. Mathematics has no foundation. So this introduces many questions about mathematics itself, most notably the big three introduced by David Hilbert. There were three big questions that Hilbert wanted answered about mathematics. Number one, is math complete? Meaning, is there a way to prove every true statement? Does every true statement have a proof? Number two, is mathematics consistent? Meaning, is it free of contradictions? I mean, if you can simultaneously prove A and not A, then that's a real problem, because you can prove anything at all. And number three, is math decidable? Meaning, is there an algorithm 
that can always determine whether a statement follows from the axioms. Given what we learned earlier about the trilemma, you might already have a hint at what the answers to these questions are, just like Kurt Gödel did. Gödel had an idea. First, he translated mathematical statements and equations into code numbers so that a complex mathematical idea could be expressed in a single number. This meant that mathematical statements written with those numbers were also expressing something about the encoded statements of mathematics. In this way, the coding allowed mathematics to talk about itself. Through this method, he was able to write this statement cannot be proved as an equation, creating the first self-referential mathematical statement. However, unlike the ambiguous sentence that inspired him, mathematical statements must be true or false. So, which is it? If it's false, that means the statement does have a proof. But if a mathematical statement has a proof, then it must be true. This contradiction means that Gödel's statement can't be false, and therefore, it must be true that this statement cannot be proved. And by placing all mathematical statements on the same boundless number line, the answer to the first of the big three was revealed. There will always be unprovably true statements. Now, Gödel was not the first one to come to this realization. In fact, Alonzo Church, inventor of lambda calculus, proved the undecidability of lambda calculus in 1936. It was Turing's paper in which, among other things, he showed that Turing machines were equivalent to lambda calculus that convinced Gödel that both Turing machines and hence lambda calculus were the right models of mechanical computation. Wow, that's a big deal. But just like earlier, the conclusion that there are unprovably true statements feels so unsatisfying to me. The trilemma really bothered me. So I came up with a solution. The Recursion Convergence Conjecture. In this paper, I introduce a communication style inspired by quantum superposition. In short, it is impossible to tell what is true and what is false, so you can choose to agree and disagree with everything at the same time with some self-assigned probability based on point of view. You must argue things you truly don't believe in, because it is impossible to tell what is right and what is wrong. The goal in doing this is to search for contradictions and resolve them. After this, what will be left is either nothing, an unprovable truth, or an unprovable truths. For the past two years, I've been using this communication style and this channel is the result. I made some extremely interesting findings and the only way I can share them in a logically safe way is by explicitly showing my thought processes in these videos. This way, both you and I have a traceable and understandable view of what I'm working on. For the more astute viewers, this finally explains the disclaimer I've been leaving in the description. For many of you, this communication style looks eerily similar to the process of learning, but the difference is how direct you are with your thinking. Those who adopt this communication style should argue for things they truly don't believe in, to exhaustion. Because if you truly believe the trilemma, then you should initially hold no beliefs. Even the trilemma is open to question. You must do your best to make statements without implications by explicitly stating your argument, no matter how convoluted and arduous it may be. You differentiate between the different ways of thinking using perspective. Without this relativistic distinction, your thoughts will become mixed. It is important to be mindful of the fallacy of the gray, a belief that because nothing is certain, everything is equally uncertain. Your goal in doing this is to search for contradictions in your statements and potentially in the statements of the person you're talking to, if they're participating. It is important to consider all information. So it is possible that we will never converge on a solution, but the best that we can do is to try. The more information considered, the more likely this is to work. Be very careful in adopting this communication style. It will operate like a virus on your brain. There's an old saying, give a person a hammer and everything starts to look like a nail. This communication style is a hammer. So if you plan on using it in the long term, be careful not to lose a sense of self by remembering what your personal goals are. If you're interested and want to learn more, be sure to check out what I've mentioned in this video by checking the description. There's a lot of great history here. I'm going to leave this video off with a clip I found after I wrote the conjecture. Have a wonderful day. What's so important about the scientific method? We set out to disprove our theories, and it's when we can't disprove them that we say, this must be getting at something really true about our reality. So I think we should do that in all aspects of our lives. If you think that something is true, you should try as hard as you can to disprove it. Only then can you really get at the truth and not fool yourself.